So uh, thank you, David, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to the Institute for the invitation to come and speak. It's the first time I've spoken to the Institute of Physics. And uh, ironically, I, I don't have any physics to talk to you about. Uh, I'm going to be talking um, about my organization, about the NEA, uh, and then um, going into some detail on a particular initiative that started ooh, over, just over two years ago, which is on uh, skills and education. Of course, this isn't a new topic. Um, uh, but we have started something that we hope will bring in uh, a new generation of nuclear physicists and also help them to sustain a career uh, in the industry that will eventually lead to them becoming um, what in the UK I know you call subject matter experts. That's a long process. The process that I'm going to talk about here tonight is really about getting that started and, and forming the network that they need to take it forward. So. Um, if I can work the buttons correctly. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I think I've just covered the outline. Um, one, one thing I should apologize for also is that uh, it's the 60th birthday of the agency. And um, like a lot of people in their 60s, they've started to get a bit paranoid that they're becoming invisible. So I'm, I'm not allowed to go anywhere without a whole load of slides that tell you the history of the agency and how it's structured. I'll, I'll try not to spend too long on those. But, but there, is some, there is some reason for doing that because the history of how the agency is developed also follows the history of how education and skills has had to evolve and how we got to where we are today, which in some respects isn't looking very healthy, that there are some big challenges out there and that's why we wanted to start this, this new program. So I'm going to inflict that on you, um, which I have to. Uh, more interesting, I think, is about where we are today. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of the program of work across the NEA divisions, and that gives me at least some chance to talk about some of the physics that's going on, particularly uh, in the area of nuclear science. Um, I, until recently, I was the head of the division of nuclear science, which works very closely with the data bank. The two are almost, you, you couldn't spit them, there's a big overlap in the work but they have slightly different functions. So I'm going to explain that and at least give you a flavor of the, of the science that's going on in those two parts. And then finally, um, get on to the, the main part of the, uh, the presentation, which talks about this uh, new framework that uh, we're starting up, uh, known as NEST, the Nuclear Education Skills and Technology Framework. Uh, it will be um, a joint undertaking at the NEA. That means that not necessarily all the countries at the NEA will be involved in it. You have to sign up. Um, at the moment, we have 10 countries sign up, and we think we're going to be starting this year. So a good opportunity, for, I hope, for me to give a, a bit more explanation to one of the communities that we really want to get involved in the project about, uh, about what will happen and what it's about. So here we are. Brace yourselves. Uh, the OECD is established in 1961. Um, it was originally responsible for administering the Marshall Plan, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, of course, that kind of cooperation was very important, well-funded, and went well, and so the countries that were part of it decided they wanted to keep it going. And then as time went on, more countries joined. The headquarters is in Paris, uh, and you see the mission there to promote policies that will improve the economic and social well-being of people around the world. I, I like there's a strap line they, they use, which is, better policies for better lives. And I think that really captures um, the, the spirit of the NEA. Um, and we are an agency, a semi-autonomous agency underneath the OECD. Here's all the OECD areas of work. You can look at these in your leisure. I uh, highlighted a few here that really um, guide the work of the NEA. So economy and education, energy and the environment, and science and technology. I think also I could have put a box around innovation um, when you look ahead to advanced systems, and particularly what materials will be needed for those advanced systems, there will necessarily be a lot of innovation needed uh, in, the area, in the area of material science. So I was pleased to see that's part of the, the, uh, the program here at Bristol. Uh, we suffer from mission statements. Here's ours. I think it's pretty clear. Um, to assist the member countries in maintaining and further developing through international cooperation. Um, International cooperation in the sense that the governments sign up to the NEA, they, they pay a fee which then we use in the regular program of work to facilitate cooperation. Actually, although we produce, I don't know, uh, 60 or 70 um, technical reports every year, the agency itself is quite small. As well as 
the fee that the countries pay, the big, um, uh, the big resource that we have access to that makes these programmes of work happen and make the reports get published is, are the cost-free experts. It's the experts from all the countries who come and participate in the working parties and the expert groups. And I'll, I'll show you a bit more of that later on. Uh, this is the uh, OECD uh, membership. Um, you can see that uh, not everybody that's a member of the OECD is a member of the NEA. So you can see Chile, Estonia, Israel and New Zealand are members of the OECD, but not the NEA. And then Russia, it's the other way around. They're a member of the OECD, but not yet a member. Sorry, they're a member of the NEA, but not yet a member of the uh, OECD. Uh, I always have a slide that nobody can read. This is it. Um, there shouldn't be many more. Uh, this is uh, a slide given to me by our communications people showing the, the wonderful history uh, of, uh, of the NEA. I thought I'd just pick out something to show you how the membership grew. Um, there were originally uh, 17 um, uh, members. They were the original OEEC, as it was called in those days, member countries. And then you can see in the 50s, Spain joined. In the 1970s, another wave of new membership, Japan, Australia, Canada, Finland and the United States. So, of course, by that time, the NEA is getting to be quite a big organization with all the, uh, the input from the United States. Then there's a bit of a hiatus until the 90s. Then we get the Republic of Korea, Mexico joining. Uh, Czech Republic in 1996. And then in the noughties, and just recently another wave, the Slovak Republic, Poland, Slovenia, Russia was an interesting one. They, they've joined since I've been there. Um, and that's been very important in the area of experimental facilities and access. The Russians have, still have an enormous infrastructure of experimental facilities, which we're still trying to get to grips with, actually, to work out where everything is and engage with the people there to see where we can, um, uh, we can encourage collaboration. And then uh, last year, Argentina, Argentina and Romania joined. Uh, we're still finding our way a little bit with those, but we foresee maybe more work in the area of CANDU reactors because they have those reactors in their countries. Uh, I, I won't go through these in too much detail. Uh, I, I guess everybody will have access to the presentation so they can sort of see some of these milestones. This is the milestones from the 60s and 70s. Of course, at that time, the focus was on new reactor systems, the front end. Uh, and you can see that uh, a lot of these uh, activities reflect that. Um, just notice at the bottom that we had the uh, high temperature gas cooled reactor uh, at Winfrith. Uh, from 1966 to 1976, which was a very successful uh, project uh, involving 12 countries. Um, the 80s saw a bit of a shift with that emphasis away from front end and all these different reactor systems that were being investigated. You start to see more emphasis on uh, the back end issues, waste management, disposal. Also, of course, the accident that happened at Three Mile Island uh, at the end of the 70s, and then the Chernobyl accident in 1986. So you can see that the, 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 some of these big, um, high-profile activities is, is shifting from the ones that we saw in the 60s and 70s. Uh, in the 90s, everybody becomes very aware of global warming. Uh, there is more uh, concern about environmental issues, and you, we see that the activities start to uh, shift in that direction. Also, I think from a UK perspective, and this is my history, is in the 90s we saw the loss of a lot of experimental facilities, certainly in the UK. As the industry fragmented, there wasn't the, the long-term funding to maintain long-term programmes, and it became very difficult for my generation of experimentalists to work with experimentalists in facilities overseas. And, and I'm going to come back to that. That's an important part of what uh, the NEST uh, initiative is about. Uh, also, you see there that uh, there were publications on the environmental and ethical basis of geological disposal. That started to become an area of, uh, of interest uh, in the UK, of course, and, and internationally. Uh, in the noughties, uh, you'll see that, well, in the U it's a mixed bag, I think, how the nuclear industry fared, the nuclear research industry. I think in the USA, there was a, there was a, a wave of confidence and it was the, there was the nuclear renaissance period. And we did see an effect of that, I think, in uh, intake at uh, universities and university programs being developed, developed to take advantage of that uh, renewed interest in the industry. But <clears throat> uh, nothing lasts forever, and by the 
the end of the decade or the start of the next one, we'd had uh, the Fukushima accident, and now countries, some countries started to take a different line, started to move out of new builds, started to talk about doing without nuclear. And we're still living with that, that we have now quite a broad context of national um, priorities amongst the membership. So you have Germany and Switzerland who are in the process of phasing out. You have the UK in the process of going into new build. Uh, we also engage with countries in the Far East, China, um, and you can see that that's a completely different picture. China is not a member, but we do, they do participate in a lot of our activities. Uh, then more recent years, the years that, uh, since I've been there, and you'll see, I, um, I think I may have mentioned it in the previous slide, in, tw in 2020, no, 2002, uh, there was a report on uh, nuclear education, um, which was uh, a cause, I think it was a nuclear education, a cause for concern. By 2012, we had another publication, which is Nuclear edu Education and Training from Concern to Capability. That's a more optimistic title, and I think it reflects some of that optimism that went along with the, uh, the, 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 the uh, nuclear renaissance that was spoken about in the United States. Um, again, I don't think I'll dwell on the detail of this. Please look through it and read it. Please visit the website. There are hundreds of reports, many of which are still have enormous technical value. That's one of the frustrations of the way things have gone. Um, how do we transmit all that knowledge that was generated by all these activities over the year? Nest is part of the answer, but only a small part of it. You see that in 2017, I'm saying that uh, we launched the, uh, the uh, initiative on NEST, uh, and we've been building it uh, through a series of bilateral discussions, visits. Also, we have now have a, a core group of um, countries who are committed to joining the project when it starts, uh, and now we're in the final stages of finalizing the agreement. So here we are today, 33 member countries. We are governed by seven standing technical committees. 75 working parties and expert groups, and 21 international projects. So it, it is a, it's a big enterprise for an organization that has about 120 staff, about 90 of which are scientists, relies almost entirely on the external experts that come and participate. Here are the NEA member countries. Um, only thing probably to bring to your attention on this slide is that those 33 countries, um, they account for approximately 84% of the world's installed nuclear capacity. So we're a pretty, big, a pretty big part of what's going on in nuclear energy production. So I'm going to start to talk less about the history and the organization and start to see how uh, the current situation on skills capability uh, has evolved. This is a photograph uh, of the NEA senior management team from 1963. Uh, I guess the first and most obvious thing to notice is they're all men. Uh, if you look a little bit harder, you'll see that although they, the, the, the dress is very formal uh, and of its time, actually these are quite young men. These are men in their 30s, 40s, maybe late 40s. Something you can't see that I think is true, I haven't checked it, but I, I, I'd put some money on it, is that Probably the majority of them had a background in experiments because when countries went into the nuclear energy business in those days, one of the first things they tended to do was start an experimental program. So I think you could be pretty sure that a lot of these, these, uh, these members of the management team would have that kind of background. Um, the other thing to notice <laughs> is this chap in the corner here, that young guy who has a monocle. Isn't that great? Wow, something's changed. So um, <laughs> if any of you are still worried, want to get me for my next birthday. <laughs> so uh, how have things changed since that photograph was taken? Um, I think the first time I can find uh, an explicit mention of uh, skills and education and manpower requirements is uh, from a, a document in 1993. Uh, and the, the general conclusion was that, the that there, there isn't a crisis, but it could be foreseen that it could become increasingly difficult to maintain a balance. So that's 1993. Then I mentioned uh, the, uh, the other uh, report. Actually, it says here it was done in 2000, so I have to correct myself. Uh, the uh, cause for concern report, uh, which now clearly identified that there was a, a problem looming. 
that the uh, future expertise uh, was at risk. Few students uh, were selecting nuclear energy as their field of study, and university programs were closing. As I said before, that sort of changed during the noughties, particularly in the United States, and more university programs opened up and more students started enrolling. And I, and I think if you look at the, um, the age distribution of, uh, of nuclear scientists and engineers, you can see that effect. So you have a hump, you have people of my generation, and there are quite a lot of those uh, 50s, 60s, in the, and in their 70s, then there's a big dip. And then you start to see younger people, you start to see an increase in the numbers when you get down into uh, the 20s and 30s age group. Anyway, one of the key, uh, I think, uh, conclusions that came out of that report I've highlighted at the bottom is access to research facilities <coughs> suitable for education and training purposes should be widened. And I would say that's certainly the situation in the UK, that there's not the same accessibility for young people to get involved in experimental programs. I, of course, I'm biased, I'm an exper experimentalist, but I, 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 I sincerely believe that. It's a very good way of getting young researchers to understand the real issues that go on. So I, I'm going to, in that vein, I'm going to say a bit about knowledge management. I guess it's familiar certainly to all the people involved in education in the room. Um, so we've been building this uh, knowledge base since, uh, since the 1950s. It had been funded through governments who were putting significant funding in for a long term, so programs were sustainable. Uh, and there was a, a pretty um, fluid environment where researchers could move from country to country. And there were several uh, projects like the one I was involved in, in that David mentioned, the European Fast Reactor Project. Uh, down in Kadarash, where uh, governments collaborated. Um, and the generations of those pioneers um, that they trained during that uh, golden era um, are now approaching retirement age, and, and, and that's me. I, I believe that a lot of the information that was generated and the explicit knowledge, this is the things you can write down in reports or include in your university program, or you can get a CD, a database of experiments, a lot of that is fairly well preserved that you can find it if you know where to look, or if the front end of your database is, is user-friendly, there are ways of doing it. And there are still enough people around that you could go and ask to find it at least where it is. I think the bit that's really going to be difficult to maintain in terms of um, uh, transferring this knowledge onto the new generation is the implicit knowledge. It's the practical stuff. And a lot of it is when something went wrong and never gets into a report. The reports, particularly for experiments, uh, the experiments that went well. But actually, it's when things go wrong that you learn a lot of very, very useful things. Uh, and the opportunity for passing that kind of knowledge on is now becoming limited, more and more limited, as that generation move into retirement. I, I've got some more words to say on that later, um, based on a presentation we had last week at the, 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 uh, the NEST meeting. So I, I've mentioned this aging of the workforce, uh, declining enrollment, that, that's variable between countries and this risk of losing the accumulated knowledge, particularly this implicit or tacit knowledge, sometimes it's, it's known as. Um, and to involve the next generation in that kind of program where they'll work alongside the experienced people, the ones who were there when things went wrong, is very difficult um, for all but the largest and best funded national programs. So therefore, of course, a strong driver for enhancing our international initiatives. Um, before I go on to talk about NEST, I'm going to say a bit about how um, the NEA carries out its programme of work, particularly the bit that I've had responsibility for, because it starts to give you a, an idea of the, the sort of environment that can be used for education and training and where we can bring in young people to work alongside uh, the established experts. My, uh, my area of responsibility was I was head of the nuclear science division, which is under the, uh, um, the governance of the Nuclear Science Committee, and then I became uh, head of the uh, data bank uh, 18 months ago. Those two sets of um, staff at the NEA and the two sets of working parties and expert groups uh, combined to uh, produce uh, services, products, reviews, a whole range of, of output in these areas, reactor physics, fuel cycle physics and chemistry criticality, safety, material science, radiation shielding. Uh, one, one thing I'd like to highlight again is this material science thing. My, my background is neutronics. Um, actually, I'm really feeling my age now because we can see that it's 
material science is where the big challenges are. If you look, if you're going to build a new system or if you want to extend the lifetime of your existing plant, this is where the big uncertainties lie. And if you look at our modeling methods, they're much more precise, much more, they're modeling the fundamental physics in neutronics, there are all sorts of experimental correlations and approximations in material science. So one thing I've been doing since I'm there is to try and bring in mater uh, material scientists into the agency. Anyway, we cover all these areas. Uh, and uh, this slide is showing you the nuclear science, the way nuclear science is organized. We have a, a set of, um, let's start in the, the middle of the slide. So the, 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 the box with the, uh, the pink on top. These boxes, these are working parties. So they have a longer lifetime. They last typically for maybe a decade. And below those, you have sets of uh, expert groups. So underneath the uh, working party on uh, scientific issues of the fuel cycle, you can see there are hev heavy liquid uh, metal technologies, fuel recycling, chemistry. Uh, they look at advanced fuel, which, is, uh, ha has, been in, uh, which has included uh, actinides, bur actinide burning designs for fuel, these kind of uh, somewhat speculative um, fuel designs for the future. Um, under the working party on nuclear criticality safety, you can see that uh, there are advanced Monte Carlo techniques. So although for some time we've had continuous energy Monte Carlo for criticality safety, uh, the, the, the computing power didn't allow us to do things like sensitivity analysis, which we can now. You can, you can uh, do sensitivity analysis, which will allow you to, when you compare to uh, criticality experiments, it allows you to identify where the most likely place for improvements in the basic nuclear data uh, will lie. Uh, so the advanced Monte Carlo is going on and Monte Carlo is now being used for burn-up calculations, which it certainly wasn't uh, when I started. There's a working party on scientific issues of, issues of reactor systems <coughs> um, with various expert groups which you can't see. There's one on multi-scale modeling of structural materials. Again, that one's covered. It's in the middle of the, the central column. That's where we, we have been bringing in material scientists and also a lot of work looking at when and what can we learn from things like atomistic modeling and molecular dynamics and how, how will that eventually feed into our models for fuel performance, which it will probably, but it's some way off yet. But we can still learn lessons from that type of simulation. The typical output from the Nuclear Science uh, Committee program uh, the, uh, this set of publications, which I've ind indicated here, state-of-the-art reviews, benchmark studies, sensitivity and uncertainty analysis, and we organise workshops, seminars, and conference proceedings. So that's the nuclear science programme. The other thing that comes out of it, as well as those, all those um, reports, uh, is information uh, and data. Uh, and when we believe that that information and data has been reviewed by the right people, the people who would know, uh, and has been formatted in a way that will make it accessible, that it can be searched in intelligently, then we, it gets passed to the data bank for it to be used generally by, um, the, 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 it's the user community, the people who use the codes and the nuclear data and the experimental databases for doing analysis on new designs, safety, um, and where they will have to in some cases, if it's safety, they will have to demonstrate the, uh, the accuracy uh, of the code uh, and also any bias that it might have, because that's what will then lead to them being able to set suitable safety margins. You'll see that, uh, <coughs> um, as well as this output from the Nuclear Science Programme, there's the Jeff Nuclear Data Project that uh, produces uh, the basic neutron cross-section data, essentially, which is used in, in many of the codes. <coughs> we have a computer programme service in the data bank. Um, we, people donate simulation codes to us, we test them, and then we try and make them available as widely as we can through these, uh, this, these scientific services. We try to make them available to everybody, that's, that's why I've got a globe in the bottom right hand corner. That's not always possible. The, the donors can um, impose constraints. So for example, they might say, they can't be used for commercial purposes, or they can only be used for nuclear medicine, that kind of constraint, in which case we'll have to narrow the, the, uh, the distribution area down uh, to the data bank service area, or sometimes we, uh, we, we, we narrow it down as far as making it available to projects that are going on in other areas of the agency. But the, the broad principle is we try and make this as, as broadly available as possible. 
So I'm going to start now trying to illustrate how this all works. It's rather nebulous. This is an example of showing how um, differential data from nuclear data, which of course David will recognize. I don't know how many other people have been involved in this type of work in neutronics, but it's, it's essentially it's the neutron cross-section data or maybe decay data, that kind of information that goes into any uh, neutronics code. Trying to show how that's fed in. Um, is converted into data that can be used by all these simulation methods, by the software, the computer programs. Needs to be verified and validated um, and then made available to the users. And we get feedback from this whole process, which helps us to identify maybe where we need new experiments, better experiments, maybe where the models, the, the physics and the models has been shown to be wanting in some way. And, and, the, and the loop goes round. And everything that comes out of it, we try and save the information to preserve the knowledge and pass it on. Trying to show that through this slide, which is a bit complicated, but I'll try and go through it fairly slowly. <coughs> so, I was talking about differential measurements, which will be done at research facilities around the world. They are given to us. We convert, we, we, we verify them, we check them. We can turn them into, <coughs> we get experts to evaluate them to make sure that there's a, con a scientific consensus that the data is accurate. We can turn them into application libraries which are then available for computer programs, which as you see are also donated to us from the outside world. Then we have a whole set of standard problems and benchmarks and also integral experiments. So differential experiments tend to be done at one neutron energy. It's, it's describing the variation in the neutron cross-section as a function of the energy. Integral experiments, that's where you do an experiment in a neutron spectrum that in some way resem resembles the neutron spectrum in your reactor. So it's good, it's good for validating the k-effective, say, because k-effective is an integral parameter, so you need an integral experiment to validate it. So you compare your um, calculated values with experimental values uh, uh, through sensitivity and uncertainty analysis, uh, and that allows the user community to, uh, first to check to see if the, the computer programs are meeting the t required target accuracies, also to quantify any code bias and uncertainty. And all this, along with the codes, is made available as far as possible to the outside world. The other thing that happens is that we get a feedback loop here that uh, when you compare the calculation to experimental values, you'll see discrepancies. Uh, and in some cases, that discrepancy might be due to the basic nuclear data. It might be due to the way the physics is modeled in the code. And so it gets fed back through the loop. And maybe we have more, better differential experiments, maybe more integral experiments. Maybe the physics modeling has changed in the computer programs. Uh, somewhat tongue in cheek, um, I've labeled this as the, the knowledge machine you'll see at the top of the, the slide. Um, it's uh, it, like Maggie Ray's painting, it's, it's not a pipe and it's not a machine either. It's an idealized picture. I keep mentioning how many people are involved in this, how, and, the, and they're not working for us. They're not a, under our direct project management control. They're doing their own thing in their own establishments. It takes a lot of work and a lot of patience to try and get all these components to fit together. Um, but luckily, in the science community anyway, I can tell you there is still this collegiate uh, esprit which people actually do work in their own time. And for countries that aren't, don't have big research projects, you can pretty much guarantee that when you sign on to a, an, an undertaking activity, at some stage before the end of it, your funding's not going to be there. Uh, and so one thing I, I really wanted to acknowledge is thank you to all those people who worked weekends and at nights to keep some of these activities going. Um, the other thing which relates to the, uh, the NEST activity that I'm going to talk about is there's a great opportunity for young people to be part of the process uh, and have access to some of this um, implicit knowledge that I was talking about. I'll just give you an example. We, um, we, we get experimental data donated to us from some experimental facility. Uh, could be the Hector reactor that uh, David uh, used to work on could be Mazurka, the fast reactor, um, the research reactor down in Kadarash that I used to work on. The data is given to us in the form of reports and notebooks, and what we first thing we do is get it reviewed, and get it reviewed by experts who maybe worked on the facility or have worked on a similar facility. It's nice to have both. And it's even better then to get young professionals in the room and hear the discussions. 
and start to hear about some of the things that went wrong and start to hear about some of the disagreements. Um, the best place for disagreements is actually in nu nuclear data evaluation. Some, some of the nuclear data evaluators argue for years and years and no, not always get an answer, but still useful for a younger generation to hear that process and hear the arguments, not just the sanitised report at the end of it all. Uh, a lot of organisations, I've said if, uh, many times now, uh, are, are involved in this whole process. Th these are just the ones for nuclear data. There, there's a whole load of other research establishments around the world that, that collaborate with us. So, um, given that history, given the uh, very wide range of institutions and research projects that we connect with, uh, we believe that there's a, a, a very powerful solution to some of the concerns about edu skills and education uh, through working in an environment like the NEA, and, and they're listed there. Um, and that it's quite interesting because some of the conclusions that we draw are very similar to the conclusions that I see on your MSc board there, mul things like being mul a multidiscipline approach, very important. I think what perhaps we're adding is this dimension of working alongside the people who got it wrong sometimes, that transfer of the, uh, the implicit or, or tacit knowledge. Um, I think I'm going to hesitate there because everything I've said so far is about the history of the NEA and about the organisation and what we do. The second part is, is, is focused on the NEA. So if there are any questions about the NEA or the programmes that I've briefly mentioned, I could take them now. So um, how, how to um, uh, galvanise the international community? Uh, to address these issues of knowledge management and skills and education. Uh, here we saw some of the things that an international organisation like the NEA can offer, uh, and that's what started us down this route of starting this uh, initiative uh, known as NEST. So uh, a little bit of backtracking here, the, some of the reports I mentioned, access to research facilities is seen as something that we would wish to do under this collaboration. Uh, we had a policy debate uh, at the steering committee um, in uh, 2016. Um, one of them was to introduce the idea. Then again in November, uh, we found out what all the members thought. So trying to pick up on some of these things that you were talking about, different national contexts and how it would be seen. Uh, there was an, certainly a consensus that something had to be done, although the best things to do varied from country to country. So. Following that, there was a, a whole set of bilateral discussions. Um, uh, in November this year, we established 10 countries, the NEST core group of countries, uh, committed to going on, forming an agreement, uh, and starting up a, a, a process of bringing in what we will call NEST fellows into this uh, skills and education framework. Um, these slides is just a sample of slides from the policy debate that I mentioned in uh, November 2016. This is a presentation by Fiona Raymond from uh, NNL um, and uh, NIRO. And you see here, the, the, she's highlighting the, uh, the problem of the ageing workforce. And also picked up on the two reports that NEA had produced in 2000 and then again in 2012. Uh, I highlighted, th these are my highlights, uh, long-term sustainability. When you look at some of the responses to the education problem, they tend to be a one-hit thing. So the Euratom project will insist that there's an education component and of course the, the proposals all have it, but when the project's finished, so is that initiative. We're looking for something sustainable here and you'll see that we, uh, the fellows, uh, we're trying to introduce them to a network that will allow them to continue to, to collaborate with each other. Uh, the Swiss presentation, I've sort of got this because of some of the, again, the, the, the variation in national context can be striking. Uh, the Swiss presenter um, pointed out that uh, it, it can be a little bit dangerous to think that uh, because you're in a phase out mode, then you don't need to worry about skills and education. They're saying, no, that's not true. You will still need qualified and motivated staff for decades to come. And in fact, in Switzerland, their estimate is that the, the requirement is going up rather than down. I've got a few slides here from the United States from this policy debate. Uh, so this, I've included the states because they're slightly different. They, they have a, quite a strong university program and they saw a big increase in numbers uh, during the noughties. But even so, they're seeing some difficulties. Uh, some of them are related to um, 
the size of the faculties uh, that they can support or that the universities are willing to support. And then you get, you have a professor leaves or a facility closes and suddenly your, your whole program is, is under threat. Uh, and uh, the presenter who was um, Paul Wilson from uh, Wisconsin University um, also mentioned that there, even there in, in the States there are now gaps in the, in the curricula. Uh, I won't dwell too much on these because I think I've got a little bit behind time. Um, the Koreans also uh, gave a presentation at the policy debate and there's some things here which really um, struck me um, about <coughs> the um, um, nurturing leadership level people. So it's what in the UK I think you're, you're calling um, uh, subject matter experts through a postgraduate program. So not just a one-off project but nurturing some sort of network. A balance between uh, education and training, so training hands-on, education, picking up the explicit knowledge. Uh, broadening, so it's not just engineering, but there's also managerial skills. Um, and also, the, they mentioned um, very strongly it should be multidisciplinary and it needs to have some sort of real-world component uh, that it, that to inspire the young people and get them into a long-term progress of accumulating knowledge, it has to be some, have some sort of real-world uh, application. There was some other feedback from the policy debate which I've recorded here. Um, as always, whenever you talk education, no one disagrees with the concept that yeah, it's important we should do it. Uh, the problem is the range of uh, criteria and national context that you're trying to, to address. Uh, most countries said that in some technical areas um, there is already a shortage of expertise. I would say for nuclear data, for example, um, fish and yields. We'd, we'd, even in the world, we're down to just a few people now. Um, some newcomers, the Finnish, for example, um, expressed some concern for them. And again, it's to do with the, the problem of small numbers. That they're trying to educate people, they're trying to create a uh, base of expertise, and then a few of them leave, and it has an enormous impact on the programme. This slide is from, uh, it was uh, presented um, uh, from, uh, by the UK uh, last week in our second core group meeting. Um, it sort of illustrates the, 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 the size of the problem in the UK. So you can see um, here their estimate. Oh, I can't get this. Here it is. I need some training myself. So you can see uh, on, in the graph anyway that the, the demand um, for uh, expertise is going to increase rapidly over the next few years. The number is quite interesting uh, in the uh, second bullet point, that they think they're going to need an extra 7,000 full-time employees per annum over the next few years. Now that covers the whole of this skills pyramid, uh, which is not what Nest is aimed at. We're aimed at the 1% the, the of that number, which is at the top of the subject matter experts. But even that, that's 70 people, 70 experienced subject matter experts a year. Wow. That's a tall order. It takes probably 15 years or more to produce a subject matter expert. Uh, so at the very least, you know we're late starting. Um, they, to make, it, to make the situation see, uh, even more, uh, uh, not bleak, challenging, they calculate that over the next five years, the UK is going to lose about a third of its subject matter experts if they take normal retirement age. Um, and point out that it's, it's expertise that takes decades to develop. So we, we need to be doing something to take advantage of that bulge at the, in the 20 and 30 year age bracket where we had some success of bringing people in to, ex to, to, to encourage them to stay in nuclear and to push them through to accelerate the process of turning them to subject matter experts. And at the same time to be doing that whilst the old generation of experts are making noises about playing golf and fishing. We've got to, they're not allowed to do that, for sure. So here are the key elements. It's going to focus on that 1% at the top of the pyramid I told you about, the uh, qualified experts and uh, future leaders, the SMEs um, in the UK uh, parlance. Um, the starting point is to engage with universities. That'll be the source of these Nest Fellows who will work on projects, working alongside uh, uh, the experts. We also see that if you're going to become a subject matter expert, you're not an expert in one narrow 
uh, field. You've also got a broader awareness of all the other issues that are out there in operating a nuclear system properly. So there, there will be education on topics like licensing and regulation, stakeholder involvement, even economics, all those things. And then following on from participation in those projects, we're going to support a Fellows Network by organising, mentoring and, 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 and facilitating their continued uh, engagement in, in international activities. So, uh, real world context, I won't spend too long on this, demanding activities, multidisciplinary and multinational. Multinational because that will be very attractive, I think, to the, uh, the young scientists and engineers. Uh, Hands-on activities to get this transfer, the uh, tacit knowledge. And also strengthening university programs. Um, it's, the, the typical relationship is you have a research organisation that works with a university. One of the things we're going to try and do is build collections of universities working with each other. That'll help some of these issues of sustainability and uh, the problems with small numbers. So, uh, launch phase, currently 10 uh, countries. We've, we're doing the rounds of getting the initial agreement uh, finalised so that we can uh, constitute a nest management board. We had the first meeting in October, second meeting last week to which the UK uh, came and gave a presentation on the nuclear skills a strategy group. Um, once we get it started, we think it may grow. I can see that with 10 countries in already and probably more, we'll be very busy managing all these projects and all the, the NEST uh, fellows that, that come along. So we, we we're aiming to finalise the agreement and facilitate um, those project proposals that we're working on. I think I've mentioned this already, so we see the, se the centre and NEST project based around some experienced R&D organisation which is where the experts will still be, we anticipate. And then we anticipate bringing in fellows mainly from universities. We, we don't specify um, a fixed range, but I think the centre of the range that we're looking at will be um, postgraduates, will be people doing PhD, but it could be postdocs, could be masters. We have some, amongst those 10 core countries that we have already, we're developing some uh, project uh, to uh, start the whole thing rolling. Um, there's a hydrogen mitigation research project. It's known as HIMERS-2. It is already one of the joint projects in the NEA, so it's easy for us to uh, build NEST into that. It's being led by Switzerland, by uh, Professor Pouts at um, PSI. Uh, the Russians are proposing a, a project on decommissioning of graphite facilities, which I guess will be of interest in the, in the UK. Uh, small modular reactors, Canada are leading, they're already working, they've already been speaking to the UK, in fact, I know, uh, and other partners. Uh, molten salt reactors um, by the Americans, they already have funding from the DOE to engage with NEST. Uh, and then there's an interesting one here, which I'm going to say a bit more about, and I think it's related to one of the, the topics uh, that was shown earlier about um, uh, auto, uh, automated robotics. Um, they're, they're looking at advanced remote technology. Of course, this is related to the clean-up at uh, Fukushima, uh, being led by Japan. I, uh, they, they allowed me to include a couple of slides from their presentation last week. So the central project it will be is known as CLADS. Uh, they have a professor um, identified as being the, uh, the lead for that. Uh, and they will bring in uh, fellows, students, undergraduates from universities in Japan. You'll see they've identified two here on the left-hand side. And then they're looking for other participating organisations from the international community to be part of this. Um, they're very keen to have the UK involved. Uh, here, here's what they propose as the sort of phase one of the programme, which will include a theoretical study, video conferencing, multidiscipline lectures, those kinds of things. Workshops at Fukushima Research Conference, site tours at one of their uh, experimental facilities, the development centre at uh, uh, Naraha, um, and Interesting, this, this is, I think that they want to get things started. They want to get some of their fellows in now. So there's part of the early task is to get the fellows themselves to identify what the research, the details of what the research plan will be, to identify tasks that they will be working on. So the JAEA and uh, MEX, the Ministry of Education in Japan, are in the process of reaching out to the UK to, to get support for this. So here's the anticipated timeline. Hope to have the agreement signed this year and the first meeting of the board. Expect, we expect to have two to three of those projects I just mentioned ready to start before the end of this year so that we can bring the first cohort of fellows in uh, to the framework. Um, 
probably working on research tasks at their home institutions initially, um, and because organising hands-on work at facilities takes some time. Uh, with edu additional education events like the ones I spoke about, licensing regulation, all these things that are not part of the central uh, aim of the project but are important uh, that uh, these matter, subject matter experts have so that they can advise on policy, so that they can lead research programmes. The aim is to ramp up NEST. I don't know how big it will get, but you, we could foresee having over 100 new fellows each year. Uh, and then facilitate their continued involvement um, in, in international activities. Which is why I put this slide in, just to remind you that the NEA already has a wealth of international activities that are ongoing and which fellows, we would in try and encourage fellows to become involved in. So that they continue to accumulate that knowledge, continue to maintain that network of contacts that they have with the people that they've got involved with during, the, during the, their time on a project. So, last slide, I think. Um, that knowledge machine is not really a machine, as I mentioned, um, but this is boiled down what we're trying to do. Um, identify, preserve, and evaluate information. Facilitate access. Um, facilitate people getting their codes in good time. <laughs> or thermal hydraulics experiments. Um, uh, apply the knowledge to real world applications. That can happen at the home institutions or by getting involved in uh, activities at the NEA. And nurture capabilities and innovation. Like I said, I see under innovation materials. We need new materials for the advanced reactor designs. And the, that's what we need to do all this. Knowledge management tools, experts, uh, still engaged with these young students um, and a sustainable international framework and you see the last message there, the, the takeaway message. To make this work, to produce real subject matter experts, they have to have access to the people who know when things didn't quite work out. It's not enough to read a book. Best way to do this on the timescales that we're talking about is to have them work alongside the established experts. And here's the horrible building that uh, I have to work in every day on the banks of the Seine, which isn't flooded in this photograph. It's been flooded quite a lot of the time in the last few weeks. Uh, I haven't got my email address. It's jim.gullyford at oecd.org. Thank you.